Ah, so I, I've been working a lot with the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breath, and I'm just noticing that sighing is one of the breaths. We have many different breaths. You know, and the sutta suggests that we notice whether the breath is long or short, but the implication is that we really notice all the qualities of breath. So as you settle back into your posture, finding a balanced and stable, upright, preferably posture, but it's fine if you need to lie down. If you are lying down, it might be better to at least have your eyes half open so you stay awake. It's, it's easy to get sleepy when we're lying down and meditating. So. And letting the body soften and settle, that can be aided by releasing the shoulders, relaxing the jaw, softening the belly, Now, this is a sense of really letting go through the body. And even in that process, we see the ways in which we are holding on, just in, in physical ways, the tightness or, you know, flexed muscles clenched jaw, and this kind of released, this release really shows us as well the kind of inner tension we hold, we often are unaware of. can call that stress or anxiety or just tension. And as we do soften and let go, there might be some resistance to that. Because that holding in the body comes from a certain mental fear, not a fear of anything in particular, but just this kind of protective impulse, the feeling that we're not safe, that it's not safe to relax, to let go. So just noticing there's any of that resistance or any that kind of background anxiety can be very subtle. And working with this It's very helpful to bring in awareness of the breath. Let the breath move deeply into the body, softening and opening the body, opening the chest, opening the belly.
So we begin working with the breath with just this sense of movement. The flow of breath in through the nostrils. The lungs opening, expanding the chest and belly rising and releasing, exhaling. We're not trying to control the breath or make it particularly deep or slow. But as we bring mindfulness to the experience, the breath will very often change just because of that attention. And that's fine. You don't have to sort of try to stop the breath from changing. And then you might start to focus on a particular point of sensation or make one area of the breath be your primary focus, like the touch of air at the nostrils, the movement of chest or belly. We're not trying to block out anything by focusing on the breath. So don't get into a kind of striving or struggle to just feel the breath. Yeah. The breath is always there. Just allow it to be there. the breath there in this greater context of experience, of body sitting. And of the felt, felt experience, the mood or mental states. We want to include those, those mental states in our awareness, at least on the kind of periphery or checking in. They very often will be conditioning what arises in the mind, how we're responding to the present moment. So if there's some mood or some concern that's been cycling through your mind, it's going to influence the experience of meditation and that also is okay. Again, not trying to create some special 
state, but to be present with what is. Sense of openness and acceptance. Being with experience, breathing with experience. At times we may get completely lost, lose all touch with breath and body, caught up in thoughts. When you notice that happening, you know, there's a kind of starting again, just reconnecting with the breath, with the posture, with the body, kind of reasserting your mindfulness in this moment. This losing touch, this getting lost in thoughts is inevitable. We are so deeply connected to our thoughts, so wrapped up in our thinking that the simple effort to sit down and follow the breath there's never going to be enough of an intention to stop the mind from doing what it's been doing for decades. So it's not helpful and really makes no sense to judge the wandering mind or to fight with the wandering mind. Again, we bring this acceptance, perhaps even a kind of compassion to ourselves when we see the, the mental states that we live with, when we see them clearly. It is difficult to be a human being, to have a mind. The wise and skillful response to that difficulty is kindness. And with that kindness, a persistence, a certain determination to not be a victim of these mental habits.
right. Um, it just occurred to me as I was supposedly meditating that um, I got an email this morning from Buddhist Global Relief, which is um, the organization that Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, started. And they are having a retreat this weekend that I signed up for. Uh, and I have not signed up for any virtual retreats in these two years. So this is my first one. So that uh, tells you something about how I feel about it. Bhikkhu Bodhi is one of the people I respect the most in the Dharma world. And so here is a link to their website. If you go on there, they will show you the front page of the website. The retreat starts on Friday. Um, and um, it's by donation. And the teachers, uh, as, uh, besides Bhikkhu Bodhi, there's a, a nun who I do not know, Venerable Ayadamadipa. And then there are two monks who I believe are from the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery or from the City of 10,000 Buddhas. Venerable Jin Huan and Venerable Jin Wei. Uh, I think I, it's, if I know, I think I recognize those names. Anyway, it's just an hour on Friday and then uh, all day Saturday and like half day uh, on Sunday. So I don't know what the, oh, they have a detailed schedule too. In any case, um, if you're interested in having a, New Year's retreat <laughs> with some special Buddhist teachers. There is your opportunity this weekend. Um, and you, if, if, uh, I don't know if they're going to see, we're going to see everybody, probably not, because it'll probably be enormous. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi is enormously popular, <laughs> uh, worldwide figure. So, um, oh, there's somebody waiting to get in. So um, it probably you probably won't see me like we won't see each other, but which would be fun. But okay, so uh, again, good morning, happy new year. <laughs> uh, as I said, I want to enter into a little uh, a period of studying um, mindfulness itself. I was. Um, one of the first things I looked at today, because I wanted to find the quote from Joseph Goldstein. He says, over a dinner t dining room table, someone once asked me to define mindfulness in just a few words. Phrases like living in the moment or being present give a first intimation of what mindfulness is. But asking what is mindfulness is a bit like asking what is art? Or what is love? Fully plumbing the depths of mindfulness requires time and exploration. There is a wealth of meaning and nuance in the experience of mindfulness that can enrich our lives in unimagined ways. And this book is an attempt to mine those riches. His book, Mindfulness. So yeah, one of the, one of the best, most accessible books on mindfulness and from really one of the best, one of the great, like, Western Buddhist teachers. Um, Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, and this is the book I'm using here, uh, I know, I'm sorry about the light, uh, and The Noble Eightfold Path, uh, and I'll put Bhikkhu Bodhi's name in the, just so, because uh, it's not um, exactly phonetically clear. Um, if you're interested in the book. He is uh, really a scholar as well as, you know, a, a very deep practitioner of Dharma. And, uh, you know, he, he sort of had his degree in philosophy. <laughs> you can kind of tell from, from his, the way he writes. Um, at times it's, it's pretty dense, but, um, but that density really allows for 
capturing the nuance and complexity of the topic. So I really just want to read from this book. Uh, there's not, I don't, I don't feel like there's much I can add that uh, if I, if I have anything to add, I will, but so this is the chapter called right mindfulness or Sama Sati. The Buddha says that the Dhamma, the ultimate truth of things, is directly visible, timeless, calling out to be approached and seen. It says further that it is available to us and that the place where it is to be realized is within oneself. The ultimate truth, the Dhamma, so Dhamma is the Pali for Dharma, same word, is not something mysterious and remote, but the truth of our own experience. It can be reached only by understanding our experience, by penetrating it right through to its foundations. This truth, in order to become liberating truth, has to be known directly. It is not enough merely to accept it on faith, to believe it on the authority of books or teacher, or a teacher, or to think it out through deductions and inferences. It has to be known by insight, grasped, and absorbed by a kind of knowing, which is also an immediate seeing. What brings the field of experience into focus and makes it accessible to insight is a mental faculty called in Pali, sati, usually translated as mindfulness. Mindfulness is presence of mind, attentiveness, or awareness. Yet, the kind of awareness involved in mindfulness differs profoundly from the kind of awareness at work in our usual mode of consciousness. All consciousness involves awareness in the sense of a knowing or experiencing of an object. But with the practice of mindfulness, awareness is applied at a special pitch. The mind is deliberately kept at the level of bare attention, which he italicizes. A detached observation of what is happening within us and around us in the present moment. You know, he's, he's really capturing, I, I think this is a really important sort of right, part of sort of explaining mindfulness, which actually I had this exact experience a few nights ago at a dinner table, somebody asking me to define mindfulness. So the, the detached observation, right? We, uh, we know that. And this is very tricky to kind of explain to someone because mindfulness is being present with it and like kind of an intimacy and really touching it directly. And yet we're saying it's detached, right? So this is very... It, it, in the practice of right mindfulness, the mind is trained to remain in the present, open, quiet, and alert, contemplating the present moment, event, sorry, contemplating the present event. All judgments and interpretations have to be suspended, or if they occur, just registered and dropped. So that I think is the detachment, right? The judgments and interpretations have to be suspended. The task is simply to note whatever comes up just as it is occurring, riding the changes of events in the way a surfer rides the waves on the sea. <laughs> All of a sudden, Bikr Bodhi's talking about surfing. You know, you just, you never know. Guy spent like a couple decades in Sri Lanka, so he, he might have seen some surfers down there. He also went to Claremont College in California, although he's from Brooklyn, so you know. If you, if you, when you hear him speak, you'll, you'll hear the Brooklyn in there. The whole process is a way of coming back into the present, of standing in the here and now without slipping away, without getting swept away by the tides of distracting thoughts. <laughs> so he keeps his little surfing metaphor going there skillfully. It might be assumed we are always aware of the present, but this is a mirage. Only seldom do we become aware of the present in the precise way required by the practice of mindfulness. 
In ordinary consciousness, the mind begins a cognitive process with some impression given in the present, but it does not stay with it. Instead, it uses the immediate impression as a springboard for building blocks of mental constructs which remove it from the sheer facticity of the datum. <laughs> the facticity of the datum. Ah, yes, I'm always worried about my facticity and my datum. This is just so brilliant, right? The way he takes this apart. I mean, I, we have to read this again. I have to. In ordinary consciousness, the mind begins a cognitive process with some impression given in the present moment. So something, you know, I see the ring light, right? But it does not stay with it. Instead, it uses the immediate impression as a springboard for building blocks of mental constructs, right? We know this when you've been meditating for a while, those mental constructs, you see them like building blocks. Oh, there's another, you know, and each block is like another step away from reality, from the actual experience, right? It's just a more of a story, more... Well, he, he uses the term. I don't want to. I don't want to give it away. The mind. Okay, the cognitive process. Okay, well, I'll go back and pick it up here. Instead, it, the mind, it consciousness, it uses the immediate impression as a springboard for building blocks of mental constructs, which remove it from the sheer facticity of the datum. The cognitive process is generally interpretative so it's not direct experience it's constantly interpreting what's happening right or interpretative Ugh. anyway the mind perceives its object free from conceptualization only briefly then immediately after grasping the initial impression oh i got that now sure let's go it launches on a course of ideation by which it seeks to interpret the object to itself to make it intelligible in terms of its own categories and assumptions, right? It becomes about me right away. It's like, oh yeah, that's, yeah, well, that's my ring light that's eliminating me and, and it's brightening, it's making it so you guys can see me and, you know, maybe I should have gotten a better one or maybe, do I have it too close or too far away? Story, story, story. To bring this about, the mind posits concepts, joins the concepts into constructs, sets of mutually corroborative concepts, right? So, you know, we tell ourselves this story and then we prove it to ourselves because we have the corroboration in our mind, right? The story which we've built then weaves the constructs together into complex interpretative schemes. In the end, the original direct experience has been overrun by ideation, and the presented object appears only dimly through dense layers of ideas and views, like the moon through a layer of clouds. Whew. You know, we get so lost. And, you know, if you've been on, I know many of you have been on retreats and had this experience where all of a sudden everything just seems very clear. You know, just the taste of the rice and the, the sun in the sky and the air touching your face. It's so alive because these dense layers of ideas and views have been removed. The layer of clouds obscuring the moon have cleared away. So the Buddha calls this process of mental construction papancha, elaboration, embellishment, or conceptual proliferation. You know, papancha, just one of the favorite words of Pali. You should learn it. P-A-P-A-N-C-A. -A. C is pronounced like C-H in, in uh, Pali. P-A-P-A-N-C-A. -A -A. Papancha. <laughs> Story of your life, Babanja. The elaborations block out the presentation. I'm sorry. 
the elaborations block out the presentational immediacy of phenomena. They let us know the object only at a distance, not as it really is. But the elaborations do not only screen cognition, they also serve as a basis for projections. The deluded mind, cloaked in ignorance, projects its own internal constructs outwardly, ascribing them to the object as if they really belong to it. You know, this is what we do with other people, right? You are like this. You are doing this to me. As a result, what we know as the final object of cognition, what we use as the basis for our values, plans, and actions, is a patchwork product, not the original article. To be sure, the product is not wholly illusion, not sheer fantasy. It takes what is given in immediate experience as its groundwork in raw material, but along with this it includes something else, the embellishments fabricated by the mind. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go on a little bit more. Uh, the springs for this process of fabrication, hidden from view, are the latent defilements. The defilements create the embellishments, project them outwardly, and use them as hooks for coming to the surface, where they cause further distortion. So it's basically like our personality, our psychological makeup right our belief system all this stuff that like creates like our our way of seeing the world is all like created by this like conditioned phenomena in, internal conditioning to correct the erroneous notions is the task of wisdom okay here that's is this is that what's going on here the cor to correct the erroneous notions is the task of wisdom but for wisdom dis to discharge its work effectively it needs direct access to the object as in itself, as it is, I'm sorry. <laughs> it needs direct access to the object as it is in itself, uncluttered by the conceptual elaborations, right? If we want to get wisdom, we, you know, if we want to really understand what's going on, we have to get to the object and get the, our, these erroneous, what's the term he uses? Uh, uncluttered by the conceptual elaborations. So we, we have to, how do we get to reality? I mean, this is like uh, a, uh, an eternal question. Now, someone asking what page I'm on, I'm now on page 77. Like, and, and it's a philosophical question, right, that's been going on, you know, Descartes and people like, what is real? What is reality? So, so this, the Buddha takes this very direct, very sensible approach. He says, well, it, I have to find out, have direct access to my experience. To correct the erroneous notions is the task of wisdom, but for wisdom to discharge its work effectively, it needs direct access to the object as it is in itself, uncluttered by the conceptual aberrations. The task of right mindfulness is to clear up the cognitive field. That's the task of right mindfulness, to clear up the cognitive field. It's a really interesting way of putting it. I never would have used those words, and I'm not sure I would have even used that idea. I mean, I guess I would, but it's really, you know... I love how simple it is. Oh, I'm just trying to clear up the cognitive field, you know which is one reason to not drink and use drugs, by the way, since this is a recovery group. Just want to maybe throw that in there. By the way, um, alcohol and drugs do not clear your cognitive field. They sometimes give the impression. They make you feel. I was talking about this with a friend the other day. Marijuana can make you feel like your cognitive field is like, whoa, wow. Wow. Uh, and I imagine that there are that's the psychedelics, and one of the reasons people like, you know, some of the ayahuasca and all that is like, oh, my conceptual field is like, oh, I'm seeing reality, a whole other. No, I don't think so. Cognitive field not clear. Mindfulness brings to light experience in its pure immediacy. 
It reveals the object as it is before it has been plastered over with conceptual paint overlaid with interpretations. To practice mindfulness is thus not so much, oh, sorry, such a good sentence to mess it up. To practice mindfulness is thus a matter not so much of doing, but of undoing. Not thinking, not judging, not associating, not planning, not imagining, not wishing. All these doings of ours are modes of interference, ways the mind manipulates experience and tries to establish its dominance. Mindfulness undoes the knots and tangles of these doings by simply noting. It does nothing but note, watching each occasion of experience as it arises, stands, and passes away. In the watching, there is no room for clinging, no compulsion to saddle things with our desires. There is only a sustained contemplation of experience in its bare immediacy, carefully and precisely and persistently. What an order. I can't go through with it. <laughs> and I think that, you know, those last few sentences really, for me, help to clarify what we do when we do mindfulness meditation. I notice that I'm thinking, and what do I do? I, I just come back to my breath. I just undo the thinking. I'm just unthinking. Very simple. It's it's elegant and beautiful in its simplicity and and highly doable, you know. <laughs> highly practical. It doesn't, you know, it's not complex. It doesn't require some visualization or special words uh, or, or even a particular intelligence you know we don't have to be special people to do this we just keep undoing and coming back so simple and and to you know and as far as to understand that let me come back to that phrase sentence i can't believe i lost it already <laughs> The task of right mindfulness is to clear up the cognitive field. Really, really a helpful concept to think, what is messing with my cognitive field right now? Because it's not just literal thoughts and words and images, right? And this is why how mindfulness becomes much more complicated. Because I realize that you know when he t he talks about the you know the latent defilements well the latent defilements aren't they only manifest as thoughts but they're really much more on the emotional level and uh, on the way we are conditioned to respond and to interpret things which is very much emotional and it, you know it's tied in with concepts but you know so much of uh, what we're talking about here i think is you know, really kind of established and conditioned in us pre-verbally. And this is why psychology and you know, therapy and psychoanalysis are can be useful tools in this process to kind of reveal what are these latent defilements. Not that we want to spend all our time looking at them, but to understand like, oh, like my cognitive field is not clear it is blurred by what right now oh it's blurred by my anger my sadness my anxiety oh okay how might that be influencing how i am interpreting this experience that i'm having right now so now obviously i'm i'm stepping out of the just purely meditative experience but into our daily lives and how you know we interpret what happens to us we have you know in our relationships and 
in our in our experiences that we interpret like oh i'm i'm having trouble doing this task and and then oh the, the i have a story to myself oh cuz i'm bad at this task because you know i'm this is my failing as a human being or so, whatever the story is right we realize oh it, it, well what's happening is that i'm having a trouble you know hammering that nail you know and I've made that into a story which then has an emotional impact like, oh, it's because I'm so clumsy and, you know, my, you know, everybody knows I'm clumsy and that's why, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, oh, God, and I feel so crappy about myself because I'm clumsy and, you know, I'm useless. And, and the story goes on, right? And I've just missed it. It's like, it's just a nail. It's just a hammer, you know, just... Just keep keep banging, you know. My, I mean, this is one of my stories. I, I guess it's one of the reasons that comes up for me, that that I am uh, not mechanical, you know. And, and, and um, yeah, uh, you could say that. And my my brother, my next older brother, Michael, is a carpenter, and I always he when he, we were kids he was always doing like science experiments and i was the one who had to run upstairs and you know get the glue or something you know i was just like the assistant and so that was part of like my story and then uh, not many years ago i was with him and he was like trying to put together some like ikea thing or something right and, and it was like he was struggling to do it and i was like wait a minute i thought he was the mechanical one and what i saw was that he just didn't have a story about how he was a failure at it. He just kept working at it. And then he figured it out. And I learned about that. And I was like, oh. And then so at some point after that, I was like doing some similar thing, like putting something together. And one of the things that happens when I try to put something together from like, I, I did this with a, a grill. I always do it backwards. I put the things on backwards. And I blame it on being left-handed, but that's part of my story. So I was like, I put it together backwards. I'm like, okay, it's backwards. Good. Now I know what's backwards. Take it apart again and put it away <laughs> together the other way. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> just, And it was that thing of just, oh, yeah, instead of like having a story about it, it's like, yeah, it might not be my strength as a human being. Like, yeah, I tend to do things backwards. But once I understood that <laughs> and that it didn't mean that I was a failure and so I should just give up. <laughs> which is like my tendency, like, oh, I can't do this. <laughs> Rather, it's like, oh, just keep doing it until you figure it out. You know, and if I remove the story, it just became a process, right? Of like trying to do something. And uh, so, uh, you know, just so interesting to, to see this, uh, this way that, that our minds cr construct the world. And, uh, and this beautiful, simple, elegant process of, of deconstructing it, of deconstructing our construction. We aren't con deconstructing the world, we're deconstructing our construction of the world. Um, and so, so uh, it seems to me that if I'm going to talk about mindfulness, that I'm going to need to talk about the four foundations of mindfulness. So uh, it looks like that's going to be uh, the, the upcoming classes. <laughs> we'll we'll start to go through them, um, which is a challenge in and of itself because uh, it gets complicated. It, it it starts out like oh yeah this is fine mindfulness of the body. By the time you get to the fourth foundation of mindfulness, you're like what wait. <laughs> so we'll be we'll be drawing from some of the uh, scholars for that to help me in my efforts to be of assistance. So um, I'm just looking at uh, the chat, and, and um, so uh, thank you, Angela, for putting in the information about um, the recordings and about Donna. So I, I do not charge for these classes, but uh, I do accept donations. There's a page actually on my website, which is about Donna. Um, and Angela has also put in a link to the uh, Buddhist Global Relief for the retreat. Um, 
And uh, I thought that I saw someone. Oh, no, I see that was just, yeah, Angela commenting. So, um, well, officially, we just go for an hour, but I, I rarely follow the official schedule since it's my schedule that I made up. <laughs> so, but I, I just I just know that um, I find a really hard time being on Zoom for, for a lo very long. Uh, an hour, I think, is a good period of time. An hour and a half is the extreme. And, and I never thought when I started this class two years ago, I didn't think I wanted to make it extreme. I wanted to make it really easy. Uh, so, so feel free to drop out uh, at any point. Well, I see that we're actually, I think we're at 44, so there's only 35, so nine people don't like me. Uh, no, oh no, I'm sorry, that's, that's latent. <laughs> that was a latent uh, defilement coming through. Uh, it came a blatant, now it's a blatant defilement. Uh, and Ms. Peruzzi, you're perusing. Hi. I'm sorry. Thank I'm you sure for the that, laughter. Yeah. yeah, that's riffing on my... Uh, thank you for the laughter. Happy New Year. Um, you too. Yeah. May it be so. <laughs> May it be so. God willing. One day at a time. One breath at a time. Um, yeah, so, you know, guided meditations are so interesting sometimes because, <laughs> right. you know, you know, so what happened when, was when you said the word victim about uh, victim, we give, we give up being victim of the mental habits or we let go or something victim wow. of mental habits. I don't remember and, even saying that. Yeah. And so, so what happened, the papancha, what happened then, oh, God. it's very interesting. So I thought of the word bully came to my mind. And then I thought, my mind is like a bully when it gets into these states at 3 a.m., especially, mm. you know, uh, lately. Yeah. Uh, um, and it really is. And so mm. I was just sort of that. And then I thought of an early bully in my life, sort mm. of just pointing a finger at me with an angry face. Mm. And then what happened was I'm just being with this. And, and then at some point, something about just opening, allowing that to be there, you know, allowing that experience, felt experience of the bully being there. And, you know, and can mm. I just allow this? And, and a uh, word forgiveness came to my mind, mm -hmm. um, even, and then, and then I, you know, und I'm, this undoing and coming back is just really helpful to frame it that way because I was really undoing something because of the guy, because of that word victim. Yeah. And um, I don't know, just something very helpful today around that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. And and I think, and and I don't think an excursion like that is unhelpful, right? I don't think you're saying that, which is interesting, right? That the sort of the the papancha, the initial papancha might take you somewhere that doesn't seem that helpful. But then by when you're paying attention to that stream of thoughts, it actually becomes revealing, right? And, and brings a kind of insight. It's not, it's not, um, insight in the you know it's not dharma insight it's it's personal insight which is also really valuable and yeah that's great thank you well it's dharma in that you realize it comes and goes it's not it's right it doesn't stay sorry or i could stay in the victim right. which is kind of my latent tendency right mm, yeah. from past which i'm undoing you know, which is what I am undoing. It's unbeing, it's being undone. <laughs> Very yeah. nice. Well put. It's being undone. Yeah. So it's Dharma in that sense, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean to undermine it and make it less Dharma, you know, ish. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Mike, you wanted to chime in? Yeah. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Yeah. So right mindfulness is... An, an area or part of the path that's been really, I 
find really tricky. I've had a hard time trying to nail it down. You know, the like right concentration, right effort seem a little more well-defined. This is hard to grasp. And so I really appreciated what you said about right mindfulness. Um, the task is being able, being to clear up the cognitive field. That was a really good way to look at it for me. Yeah. And it's kind of like you were saying, it's almost like the negative. We're, we're taking away here. We're making it simpler, right? It's kind of like the concept yeah. of effortless action. Hmm. You know, we, we, right. we want to make it easier, not harder. Not trying to focus harder, but just it's almost like an ease thing. We just all that. What did you call it? The papacha, the yeah. Yeah. piling on that we do. Gosh, today during the meditation there were several times i was just totally lost because of my mind just kept thought of something and then it just raced away with it and you know i just like the simplicity of what you were talking about today so thanks for that yeah yeah and uh, you know it strikes me that there are these sort of interesting contrasts or paradoxical elements here and i and i pointed first of all to that paradox of um that mindfulness has this detached quality while it's also trying to be extremely intimate and touch the object very directly. But there's also, uh, as you know, you're pointing to that, um, the undoing that, that eventually can seem kind of like trying to return ourselves to this pre-verbal state. So it's almost like trying to return to infancy in a way. And yet, it's that's being done with this very high, you know, um, prefrontal <laughs> cortex thing, you know, of, uh, of consciousness uh, that's, that's acutely aware, that understands the, the context of what it's experiencing that's seeing you know that classically is seeing the emptiness or the seeing the the impermanence or seeing the not self in it which is like very sophisticated and conceptually and, and not just conceptually but cognitively so uh that's you know it's something i don't really understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just pointing out that there is this really interesting thing and I, I don't know quite what to do with it. And maybe it's one of the questions I will bring to, um, might maybe ask, we'll ask Bhikkhu Bodhi this weekend. <laughs> Monica, hi. can't remember where to unmute. Um, I, um, I, I, it's, it's, I, I like what the answer is just, um, mindfulness is so fascinating. And, well, my mother came down with Omicron and mm. they hospitalized her yesterday. We can't go in. Oh, sorry. And she's 96. So, oh, yeah. That happened. But, uh, and vaccinated, but you know she's in that that high risk category. But I'm I am fascinated that I haven't had a need to panic. Mm -hmm. But then doing the mindfulness, then I have that little guilt thing starting. You know, like why am I not more upset? You know? Ah, right, right. Yeah, you know. So I thought that was really interesting with the mindfulness and the guilt. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like why am I not more upset? <laughs> Why am I not panicking? Da, 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 you know, and, and yeah. while my family is just running around like, you know, when you scatter sand on an ant's uh, den and they just run all over the place, that's the way it felt like watching them. I was watching them do this. And mm. I'm like, um, that's, it's just a comment, but thank you for all yeah. this. I mean, I couldn't do it without all your infinite wisdom and my meditation teacher and everybody here. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. And I hope she recovers. Uh, I just, as a closing aside, uh, yesterday I was looking at the IRS uh, 
table of life expectancy <laughs> because at 72, I'll turn 72 this year, I have to start withdrawing from my, uh, you know, IRA. And it said I have 25.6 years. And, and I said, oh, well, great, I'm going to live to be 86 and a half. And, and then it took me until today to realize, oh, no, 96 and a, 97 and a half. <laughs> so that's just like your mom. Like I'm, I'm going to be live at least as to be as old as her. So good to know. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be around for that long, but uh, that's what the IRS and you can't. You know how could they be wrong, right? <laughs> it's that's uh, anyway. So, my dear ones, thank you all for showing up this morning, showing up for yourselves, bringing your mindful attention, not to me, but to your own experience. Uh, and um, well, I'll be back on Friday evening, um, 7 p.m. Pacific time, and I will start talking about the four foundations of mindfulness to the best of my ability. Uh, yes, clear our minds, indeed. Thank you, Abraham. All right, blessings, stay safe.